I had handled a lot of serpents before that dreadful Sunday that I was fatally bitten. I was very dedicated. I prayed, sung, played my guitar. I just eat one meal a day, and I wouldn't eat nothing the nights that we went to church. We were having a regular Sunday meeting. A lot of people were there at the service. You could feel the excitement in the air. I was so happy to be in God's house. There wasn't very many women that handled serpents, so I, I was an example, a spotlight, I suppose, for all the serpent handlers to love and to admire, I suppose. Service began. The music began to play. We were shouting and rejoicing. They began to handle the serpents. The preacher handed me a black timber rattler, one of the most deadliest serpents in the state of Kentucky. It was laying across my two hands. I started to give it back, but I didn't. So I turned around and kept it a little bit longer. I thought I was feeling so good. When I did, it raised its head and bit me on the right hand. And it started to bite me again, but the preacher grabbed it. And he said later he'd never forget how I looked at him when he took that serpent. It was to say, you said it wouldn't bite me if I believe what now? This same snake in another church service bit a young brother. He got scared. His faith failed him, so they rushed him to the hospital, and they done everything they could for him. They gave him the venom, everything they thought he would be fine. He was sitting up in the bed laughing, and he suddenly fell over dead. I attended his funeral later. That was the most horrible thing I had ever saw in my whole life. He was swell so big that his body looked like it, it was about to burst. They had a black veil pulled down over his casket when they opened him because he was swell so big. They even handled the serpents at his funeral shouting that he was a martyr for the gospel. Back to me. I began to feel numb around my eyes, nose, and mouth. My vision became blurred as the poison began to go through my body, I suppose. They began to stop the service and pray for me. A lot hadn't realized I'd been bitten. Seems like only a minute I passed out. And one of the preachers carried me out of the church to the next house that belonged to one of the preachers. He laid me on the bed. Two or three went with us. The rest stayed and had church and continued to have church. I knew I was dying. I f could feel my spirit leaving my body. I felt like I was sinking down in a dark hole. I was sinking down, down, down I was sinking. I was falling into a pit of darkness, which to me was hell. As I was praying... While I was falling down, down, down into darkness, all of a sudden the Lord began to talk to me and my spirit entered back, entered back into my body. I began to hear a sister praying as the spirit came back into my body. I asked our minister later if I had a died, would I have went to heaven? Because all I was seeing was darkness, not realizing that I had taken my eyes off Jesus and had made a God image out of her preacher. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, which will send you to hell. How easily we can do that, not realizing it. My And my arm, get back to that, my arm began to swell so big that they had to cut my blouse off. Blood come from around my teeth that I had to spit up ever so often. I threw up a pan full of poison. I threw it up. My arm swelled so big it looked like it belonged to a 400-pound woman. And it turned black and all over with big purple blood blisters all over it. The poison destroys the tissue in your skin. As the days went by, it began to swell and smell like rotten meat. My arm was actually rotten. 
I was going into shock and my nerves was about to break down due to so much pain. You're not supposed to be moved when you're serpent bit. But they moved me from that house. They moved me over to another sister's house. From that, that house, I was about an hour away from home. They moved me from that house. That was twice. Then they moved me from that house back to my hometown. And then they moved me again back to another house. And they moved me four or five times. And you're not even supposed to be moved when you get serpent bit. So only the mercy of God that I w I'm alive today, but God wasn't done with me. And they prayed around the clock for me. When they finally got me settled into one place where I was to stay, I had so, many, so much company, they couldn't believe it. Or you couldn't believe it. They probably believed it. Some just wanted to see what I looked like, you know, and some really cared. I never worried about it at all. I knew the Lord would take care of me. I had a childlike trust in God and His people at that time. Someone had to stay in my bed day and night because I could go into convulsions or anything could happen to me, and most likely I didn't know it at that time, but they could have got sued. They took turns sitting with me. When it was the minister's turn, the one that I had the most confidence in, sat by my bedside and prayed. When I was in so much pain that I couldn't bear it, they would get, begin to pray, and the Lord would move the pain. It never stopped, but it would ease up to where I could bear it. The minister, when it was his turn, the minister, when it was his turn to sit by my bed, watch and pray for me, he began to say little things to me that broke my spirit and heart. He began to yield to the wrong spirit. My mind couldn't cope with this. Here I was on my deathbed. I needed his prayers. I was in torment and pain. And he was entertaining the wrong thoughts in his mind. My mind could not handle this. And I dare not tell nobody. I never wanted, never wanted to hurt nobody. I've been that way all my life. I've never wanted to hurt nobody. I've suffered plenty myself to keep from hurting other people. My sister came in from Indiana and went to the police station to try to get them to get me out of that house and take me to the hospital. They said, Lady, she's been in there too long. She's in the hands of a higher power. You only have approximately 45 minutes to get to the hospital after a rattlesnake bites you. And I had been in there for days after the nightmare was over and I began to re recover. It's just, there's just no way I could have lived through that. Just a absolutely. I, I can't. It would take forever. I, I couldn't probably could hit some tell how many hours it would take for me to sit here and tell everything that I went through in that shape. There is no way no human could have lived through that. The snake bite, let alone everything else I had to go through. I went back to church and began to hear a leader preach that had entertained thoughts and said things to me that was out of the way. Well, I was young in the Lord, and I didn't understand all that. You know, I thought everybody had to be it was perfect. And my mind became so confused that I finally quit going to church because I thought everybody that, that was a Christian was a Christian, you know. I began... I became extremely sick mentally, depressed. I couldn't sort all that out in my head. I stopped praying and lost my relationship with God after coming through all that. The, the, mental, the mental anguish, the confusion that I was going through in my mind was, to me, was done more damage to me than the serpent bite. I got over the, the poison from the serpent, the rattlesnake. I got over that a lot quicker 
Then I got over the mental part of it. Well, the people had me so confused. Not all of them, but the ones that wasn't living right, doing right. I was so depressed, I stopped praying and lost my relationship with God. Can you believe that? After all that, because I was young in the Lord, I stopped playing music and singing, which I love to do so much. I just kept going downhill until I lost everything. I got to where I couldn't go to church nowhere. Because when I did, I would have flashbacks of that preacher and wanted to run out of the church house. It affected my nerves so bad, I would break out in hives and shake and have panic attacks. And I couldn't hardly breathe at times. I be, I couldn't get in crowds or anything. I, was, it's, I got in such a shape in my nerves. I actually had a nervous breakdown, didn't know it. But I began to, to entertain thoughts. I began to get hate in my heart for all churches. I, I, I was blaming everybody for everything. I blamed all of them for everything. I couldn't stand to see a person that looked like a, a wholeness person. My hair was long, and every time I looked in the mirror, I would see them wholeness women, self-righteous. I looked just like them, so I cut my hair on top and left the back of it long so I wouldn't look like exactly like the people that I thought had drove me crazy. Years went by. No words could describe the awful shape I was getting in. I began to hate everybody. The church, men, preachers, especially men. I began to put a wall around me to where no one could get to my heart again. I never wanted to love or trust or confident no one ever and especially go to church ever again so I would never be hurt. So I began to isolate myself. No one could reach me. I wouldn't even I love an animal. I loved animals. If you saw me, I always had an animal. But I, I didn't want to love an animal no more because every time I did, they'd get killed. Something would happen to them. So I began to live a very lonely, isolated life. Even though on even though I were in public, I was still alone. I even took on another personality to hide the pain that I could not bear or cope with. I couldn't get it sorted out in my head. All that, I, all that had happened to me. And you wonder why that I don't want to hurt nobody else. Or why I don't want to hurt sheep. Well, believe me, I know what it feels like to be devastated and be so let down and hurt by, by people that's supposed to be in high positions. Well, I'll hush on that, but I, I just couldn't deal with all the things that I was going through, so I just pretended it didn't exist. Have you ever had a problem you just couldn't seem to deal with, so you just wanted to just put it back in the back of your mind or somewhere and just forget it. Cover it up, pretend like it's not there and pretend it don't even exist. Well, I began to, I became the most miserable person in the world. Everyone thought I was fine. I really could pretend good. I had learned how to do that. To keep and cover up and protect everybody else. I'd suffer myself to protect other people. I'd always give some reason why that I did this, why I did that, but I'd never really tell them why and what was going on. Well, I worked until I got me a job, and I worked until I was able to build me a home, had new vehicles, expensive clothes, perfect credit. I had a pocket full of credit cards. I could get anything that I wanted. Everyone thought I had it made, and I was so, so miserable. I could never tell how miserable 
miserable I was. Years later, I began to try to go to church. I never took off my dresses all through this period. Everyone still thought I was still a little angel going to church. I began to go to church again. I, I wanted to just see how many hypocrites there was in them, which that was terrible to me. But bitterness, I began to entertain bitterness. I got bitterness in my heart, blaming everybody for what happened. Yet deep in my heart, I was really crying out for God to help me. But I had God in such a shape in my mind and spirit, I would never be worth anything in church again. I could not. I could never be able to function in a church. I had so much hate against the church, I would go and just see if anyone knew the condition I was in. Most of them didn't know a thing. They thought I was an angel. There wasn't a thing wrong with me because I had a dress on. I was sanctified holy. I couldn't, but they couldn't see inside me how hurt and how bewildered, how broken without God, confused, tormented. I was, how broken I was. I, all I could say is, in, down in deep inside my spirit, I couldn't even speak. I would just cry out in my innermost being, God, please help me. Help me, Father, help me. That's all I can say. And years, year, and nobody even knew it. And years went by, finally, had to quit my job. My nerves got so bad. I would have panic attacks when I would drive. I would have to pull over off the road and sit for a while until my nerves would calm down, especially if I was trying to go to church. The Lord would still, was still with me, whether I knew it or not. I was learning a great lesson from all this. If you could have only seen inside of me, you would know beyond a doubt that God would have to perform a miracle for me because I would could never do anything for Him. It seemed hopeless. My life seemed to be over. I would never, never be happy again. Years went by. And I started attend, attending, I'm sorry, Brother R.A. West's meetings in West Virginia. The Lord began little by little to touch me in his service, his services as I would go. And I began to feel better, yet I was so withdrawn, afraid to trust completely that he could never really lead me to the place of deliverance. He was a good man, a very clean, decent, good, good man. But I just had so many problems of trusting where I had been let down so much that I just couldn't let go and trust him with all my heart. So I drawed back to a certain point. And Brother Larry McCamus in one of Brother Wes's meetings told me about a prophet named David Terrell. So after I was told of this supposed to be a great prophet, I thought, well, we'll see. So I, I, so I attended his tent revival. I wanted to see, see if he was a hypocrite like everybody else. Yet, ye men, in Acts 3.12, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk? His name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you, ye see and know. Well, they said he was an end time prophet. An apostle. I wondered 
naturally, if he had, if he was a hypocrite like all the rest, was he for real? Was the miracles that I was seeing real or just a put on? Well, I was about to find out. If anyone could find out, I thought I could. I was brave. I took the front row seat under his tent. I thought before service started that I was getting, I'm getting out of here. These people are weird. All they do is walk around and pray. I had never seen nobody pray like that. This is probably a cult is what I was thinking. It's a cult. Well, I decided to stay and see it through. I drove a long way. So I'll just see it through. Well, the prophet they call, the preacher I call, finally, he finally come out. He fell down on his knees and began to pray. Man, I had never heard anybody pray like that man prayed. And it was really getting to me. My brick wall I had up was beginning to melt. When he got through, he stood up and began to talk. And I couldn't move. I mean, I, I, I wasn't going nowhere. Then he began to walk toward me. I froze even more. I could not move. I could not move. Whatever had me bound was fixing to turn me loose. But I didn't know what was going on. I was scared. But I knew I wasn't going anywhere because I couldn't move. He prayed and prayed for me. And my wall slowly started melting. His anointing pierced through that wall that nobody could get through. I mean the anointed, it pierced through my heart and my soul and my spirit. It broke everything. The man was so anointed. He was so anointed. He told me how I was fighting suicide spirits, how I'd been abused and tormented and mistreated, and how I had isolated myself for so many years and told me how many years it had been. And he was right. And things that I had never told nobody, he didn't know, he couldn't, nobody didn't know. As I, as I can't remember word for word, but I'm sure he told me, I know he told me how I lived, how clean, and what a good neighbor I tried to be, a light to the neighborhood, and how I conducted myself properly and decent where I lived, and a whole lot more I can't remember. He also told me that I was chosen vessel and ordained by God. A chosen vessel. I was chosen for the gospel and I was ordained by God, not man. How could I be chosen for anything the shape I was in? This prophet knew what he was talking about. God used him to reach way down inside me where no one but God could reach. My wall was like iron. No one could reach me. Only God could do this. My heart totally trusted and accepted Him as a messenger from God. I had been so wounded that no one could reach me. I wouldn't listen to no one. No one was going to deceive me ever again. The man of God told me things that I had never told anyone. Only God knew. So how could I doubt it? I felt so much of the divine love, compassion, gentleness, yet power, most powerful anointing from God, from this prophet, set me totally free from the chains of religion and torment and spirits. 
panic attacks, everything. I was now, I am now honored to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Well, Satan thought he had destroyed one of God's chosen vessels. Well, he done a good job of trying to destroy me. But God turned it all around for my good because all the time I was wounded, I was learning how it felt to walk a lonely road, no one to help. A broken and a contrite spirit, which was unbearable at times. I learned what it was like to seek help in the churches and couldn't find any. I learned of all the sin that was in the pulpits, how people were so cold and didn't live what they preached. All these things I needed to learn, because you see, you won't make it very far serving God if you don't get your feelings dead by allowing the Holy Ghost to crucify them. You must learn to put God first no matter what. No matter what others do, it don't affect your walk with God. The Lord will give you victory over these things when you see, when He sees that you are going on no matter what others do. It will cause you to want to be real and honest before the Lord because you don't want to be like the people that had destroyed you and they, and, and they can't affect you no more. Excuse me. You want to be a real Christian, one that God can use to help others that is in the same shape that you're in or was in. Without, without Him, we can do nothing, but through Him and His divine love, we can do all things. We must come through it with love and pray for the ones that done us wrong, and God only can restore and put the love there. It's not a have to or try to. God has to do it. Brother Turrell baptized me. Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. In Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And they cast him out of the temple. And they cast him out of the synagogue. John 9.34 this is what you can expect when you really serve him and refuse to bow to man and come under their doctrines. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Doest thou believe on the Son of God? He said, He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Man can fall. I have learned the hard way. But Jesus will never fail us. He will give us the best if we put him first. We confident the spirit of Jesus in the man. They can fall just like anyone else. If we are built upon the rock, we can stand no matter who fails us. Jesus, the great deliverer, he will dry your tears and fill your life with joy. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line a lesson well learned always listen to that still small voice if i had have listened to that still small voice inside of me i would have never gotten involved in the serpent handling churches and a lot of the other churches if I would have listened but I did not listen and all this that I went through I learned a lot but this was not God's divine will to take me through all this hell what 
got me out of all this hell, what took me through all this hell, was because I did not listen 